And this is something like 13.1% of the personal and household loans, the portfolio of, of personal and household loans. Other sectors, there's something like 170 billion that have been restructured. And uh, tottering in all this, you have 273 billion that have been restructured. And this is about um, almost 9.5% of the total loan book. The total loan book is about 2.8 trillion Kenya shillings. Now, this is only in the first six weeks, and we know there has been an acceleration in the current month of uh, May. But I think the point here is, again, we urge uh, the, uh, those that uh, have been affected by this pandemic to go and visit their banks, have a conversation. Have a conversation with your banker and explain to them. Maybe bring your, um, your, your, your pay slip um, and also bring your, the letter that you had maybe that sent you home or you know, laid, laid, laid you off or those letters that actually indicate your specific situation. You do have, uh, for instance, shops that uh, the number of clients have come down dramatically, like malls, as you know, and they too have had uh, uh, that conversation with their bankers, which has helped them also transmit the benefits to their uh, clients, or should we say their, uh, their tenants. So it is important, again, to underscore the need uh, to deal with this in a systematic and, uh, and uh, I would say, organized fashion. So those are the, 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 the important points in terms of uh, the decisions that uh, the, the MPC made. Um, so as was indicated in the press release, it was clear that uh, the measures that were put in place at the beginning, um, including obviously the reduction in CRR and all the other measures, were still working, and the reduction in the CBR, were still working this, themselves through the system. And, and there was going to be the economic stimulus program that, was, that is going to be put in place shortly. So, on the on balance, um, they assessed that the the stance of monetary policy was was the correct one, and uh, we needed to see uh, those other measures and see what is it uh, that their impact, how is it that they are going to support the economy, and then um, advise accordingly, or let's say take actions accordingly. In the interim. Of course, the, we will maintain our stance in a watchful gaze on the economy, uh, monitoring developments in all, in, in all areas. That's all I wanted to say in terms of the specifics, but now I have a few items which may be of interest to you, so I'll just go through them and we'll, we'll see where, uh, whether these are of interest to you. I, I want to go back to the a point I mentioned earlier about the SMEs. Um, the, and this was uh, one of the points of focus of the economic stimulus program, and wanted to underscore the urgency of uh, dealing with that, and in fact, the urgency of putting in place the credit guarantee schemes. And uh, the urgency is clear to us. We have, we are close to the some of this sector. I mean, some of the operators in this sector. So we understand it. Um, we, in a sense, have a pulse on, uh, on, on, on that part of the economy. And uh, suffice it to say that uh, SMEs, MSMEs as well, um, don't have a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, buffers in terms of credit or in terms of other resources that they can use. And therefore, uh, they, they generally would die quickly. Um, they are, so they are very vulnerable in that sense. And as a matter of fact, uh, there was a survey that was done in, at the end of April, and that survey indicated that three quarters, three quarters of SMEs, of the surveyed SMEs, would, do not have cash beyond two months. So that means by end June, this uh, three quarters of, of SMEs 
would be, I mean, they're on the ropes. They'll be gone because they don't have any cash to keep the lights on, to pay for even, uh, yeah, all their things, that, uh, supplies, if they have to get supplies, or even to pay for their own workers themselves. So that is how critical the SME issue is. Now, it's not just, however, it's not just financing. The SME situation is not just an issue of throwing money at SMEs. It's also an issue, it is finance plus. It's an issue of also providing them with appropriate uh, solutions for their, cons for their problems. For instance, um, uh, products, demand for products. Now it's true, we know some of the SMEs have uh, switched to um, uh, making the PPEs, the personal protection equipment that uh, the wind, the masks, and other things like this. But it is important for uh, whatever action is taken place, whatever policy action that is taken place, that will be put in place, to be focused not just on uh, finance, but also on the other side of it, which is the plus side, which is the products and things like that, so that the SMEs can actually um, produce for particular markets. It's that sort of connection that we, are, we want to underscore. So that's the reason for the urgency of the credit guarantee schemes. Um, because if, if we don't have one quickly, as I say, the, the, the matter is dire and it will only get worse. There won't be a solution and uh, it will get worse. That's one point I wanted to make. Um, on other points, there, was, uh, there are some concerns by some of you, I think, about so-called IFRS 9, and how does this relate to what uh, the policies that we, or let's say the, the measures that we uh, recommended to banks and uh, banks are undertaking in terms of restructuring loans and things like that. I think that is a much more technical issue. Uh, and I think it is fine to raise it in technical sort of uh, in a technical way, but I want to make a few points on this. It is true we have looked at this thing, uh, and it is important to understand that yes, uh, they, they, we do not want it. We, what we cannot do is to allow this to become sort of a critical issue that. Uh, that indicates that there will be significant increase in credit risk of uh, specific uh, borrowers and things like that. So uh, we have, soon after we made our announcement, the BIS, actually sometime in mid-April, did issue its guidance as well, which is completely consistent with ours. And indeed, we are talking to ISPAC. Um, these are the ones that uh, are close to the auditors, so that there is a, a guidance note on the application of a uniform approach. It is true some of you have been concerned that there may be a haphazard uh, non-uniform approach, and therefore this is why uh, it is important to work with those particular institutions that are charged with that responsibility, but explaining to them uh, how is it that this uh, would or could or should take place. From our perspective, this is, uh, these are exceptional times. This is highly exceptional and unusual circumstances that we face. And in the circumstances, and uh, it is not the individual borrower, uh, borrower's credit risk that has changed. Um, as a matter of fact, um, providing that temporary relief um, would, or else during that, let's say, gap period, um, when the economy reopens um, the, and the, the borrower continues, I mean, if everything is as before, then credit risk wouldn't have been changed, wouldn't have um, in any way been altered. The point, of course, is that the banks need to assess uh, that well so that it's clear that uh, um, the, the, they are not penalizing themselves, nor are they penalizing the, the borrower. So. I want to leave it there. I want to make it clear that it is not a mechanical sort of uh, issue. It cannot be done mechanically, as uh, most of you understand. But I think the point here is not to worry about it because we, we, are, um, we are working with the various entities and following 
the general, uh, let's say, approach that other uh, institutions, meaning regulators such as ourselves, are doing in their own jurisdictions. Um, there was a final point, well, maybe two points, really. There was a final point about uh, uh, innovation, and I think this was raised by Professor Demo in the in uh, in an in an op-ed in today's uh, one of the papers today. Um, and I think uh, I would uh, I would differ with uh, Professor Demo on this one. Um, his concern is about innovation, and he was talking about innovation and CRBs, the credit reference bureaus. Um, that the recent, uh, recently implemented regulations may be stifling innovations. The other points he made, uh, also in terms of the banks' roles with the role of the banks with the uh, fintechs and things like that. So I'll just make a couple of points on this. This is a this is a question that is as old as time. The balance between uh, innovation, more generally speaking, and uh, regulation. In a sense, we all know that uh, uh, innovation cannot be allowed to run uh, amok in the, uh, in the economy or anywhere for that matter. Unfettered excesses of market, of, uh, let's say, capitalism will obviously be, uh, will also be de detrimental to particular ways. So I think that is clear. There's a, policy is always about that balance, you know, balancing the need and, should we say, the benefits of innovation and constraining so that the, you don't have those uh, negative externalities uh, that uh, could come. For instance, we made this point very clearly about the issue of consumers. You know, consumers need to be protected and the consumer, um, should we say, the, 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 the way the consumer is dealt with uh, is important to us as a society, as a people, and innovation does not uh, get a free license to do that. I think that is clear. But I think also, so that is something we'll continue to work on. We are not going to change that, and we are not the only uh, institution in the world that actually makes it very clear. And we have been in this journey for several years, and it has worked quite well. Secondly, the role of banks. Here I think uh, with fintechs, here I think he, there's an issue as well. Banks are no longer uh, at odds with fintechs. As a matter of fact, over the last couple of years, the banks have been working hand in hand with fintechs. They've been working hand in hand with fintechs, uh, particularly in dealing with those solutions. So I think the point there of thinking that the banks are sort of uh, at war with the fintechs and stopping them uh, is really uh, is, does not uh, agree with the facts as they are. As a matter of fact, as we know recently, uh, some of the, and we've been looking at some of the fintechs uh, closely uh, in the context of our work, for instance, in the context of the Asian, African, African Asian FinTech Festival, we had uh, a whole bunch of uh, FinTechs that have been working with us, and we have continued to monitor them during this period of time. And a lot of them have succeeded quite well, even despite the, uh, the, the, uh, the pan pandemic. Um, there are actually three that are quite significant in terms of they did well in our ranking um, in, the, in the hackathon that we had. Um, and these are, uh, for instance, there's, the, there's a, one of them known as Quara, which is doing work with SACOS, um, very interesting work. Actually, they're expanding, not contracting. There's another one known as LAMI, which is also doing insurance in uh, particular ways, digital uh, platforms. Um, also, they are working hand in hand with other institutions, including banks, and they're expanding, not contracting. So I think the, the facts uh, are clear, and uh, innovation uh, does not in any way, uh, should not be left on its own. There has to be that balance, which we believe as regulators, um, we are at the right place to make that balance. Um, 
The last point I wanted to make is on Moody's. Uh, you, do, you do recall a few weeks ago, Moody's did issue a, a statement about Kenya. And uh, in effect, what they did is they revised the outlook, the outlook, um, the rating outlook from balanced to negative and uh, or stable to negative. But they did not revise the rating itself. They kept, they confirmed the rating as it was then. And I think it is important because they did, rate, they did indicate why is it that, uh, they had, uh, that they had come up with that outcome. And I think from our perspective, yes, we did see that uh, their concern was uh, that uh, there was an increase in, uh, in let's say, demands on the, on the budget, on the fiscal authority, and indeed an increase in, a rise, an increase in uh, debt levels. And, uh, and in a sense, it was also accepted, appreciated that that was because of the conjuncture that we had, meaning the pandemic, in the context of the pandemic. By the way, virtually every single country has uh, ended up having, uh, let's say, an increase in uh, budget deficit in this time. Because the balance, again, we go back to this issue of balance, you know. Uh, life is about balancing things. So the balance, again, between uh, maintaining a sort of a, a path, a, con a, a consolidation path, um, or uh, working to deal, meaning provide resources to deal with the, um, with, the, with the health crisis so that it may not become an economic and financial crisis, that balance obviously has to be struck. And, uh, and I think that they were quite, they acknowledged that, and that's why the outlook was, uh, was revised um, to negative and uh, they maintained the rate. So I want to stop there. I'm sure you have many other questions. So, um, so I'll let you answer the question. I'll, I'll listen to the questions and answer them. Thank you very much.